Boy, what a week this has been, has it not? Britain has exited the European Union. They are now free from the, many of the uh, limitations that uh, they were experiencing and looking forward to kind of reconstituting many of their um, regulations that have managed their economy and so forth, breaking loose, trying to make deals with the United States, of course, of which this current administration is anxiously looking forward to re-engaging Britain on a uh, more intimate level. We've had, of course, as I've been mentioning here a little bit about this coronavirus that has basically captured uh, much of the headlines and news that we've been hearing and exposed to over the week, as well as, of course, impeachment, impeach 45. Of course, I mean, I think we are about filled up to our eyeballs with a lot of that and what's going on, and perhaps uh, we'll be rounding third here and heading home to uh, leave that kind of in the past. But, you know, brethren, it goes to uh, illustrate, and what I was uh, basically wanting to say is how so much is going on today. I mean, so many things, and you can't even hardly keep up with it. I don't know about you, but with the amount of venues we have and mediums that we have now to gather information from, uh, I'll tell you what, you could spend a lifetime just reading, 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 and reading. You know, it kind of uh, brings back to my mind the scripture about how uh, there is no end to learning and no end to reading of books, you know, that's in our Bible and it cautions us about taking in all this information and spending so much time when there really is, in some cases, uh, no answers and we just kind of uh, end up chasing our tails. But it does go to this fact that today we're living in different times. Without a doubt, we're living in an information age. I think you'd all agree with that, wouldn't you? That the information age that we're living in could easily be defined as TMI, too much information. I mean, sometimes you just got to kind of unplug from all this stuff because it becomes just so overwhelming in so many areas of our lives. And the Internet feeds a lot of this stuff. The Internet has a lot of topics on it, ideas and theories on a broad, broad range and scale of different subjects that, frankly, many of us have probably spent far much more time than we'd like to admit on it, chasing rabbits down rabbit holes to find out whether or not this is true or that's true or what's the end of the story of this event or that event or what happened to that person, did they ever solve that mystery, on and on it goes. And a lot of the stories on the Internet are designed to just keep you hooked, you know, so that you continue to hit on the, on the website or whatever, YouTube, uh, and continue to go to part one, you watch ten, part two, <laughs> You watch ten minutes, part three, you know, and you keep going on. Finally, it's part twelve. You know, and you're watching it one after another, and they hook you with these little ten-minute vignettes. And we do the same thing with uh, the armor of God, some of our products, and so on, because that's the marketing techniques and tactics uh, that so many people uh, do indeed use. But frankly, a lot of this stuff, and and I get it. You know, is some some of it is plausible, some of it uh, captures your attention, and you say, you know. That, that, that kind of seems like it could happen. That, that, that kind of is under, possible and understandable. And you know what? I, I kind of get that. And while other things are just, I mean, they're just flat off the rails. I mean, you've got things on there from soup to nuts. I'll just give you an example of a few things. I mean, there's still a group out there that believes the earth is flat. They literally believe the earth is flat. And you could go on the Internet and find out all kinds of information that support their argument that the earth is indeed flat. There's also a group that believes that the earth, the earth, and not only the earth, but the whole universe is only 6,000 years old. And you could go down to the Creation Museum down there in Cincinnati, and you can go in there and walk through the Creation Museum and see mannequins of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with a Tyrannosaurus Rex in the background, in the garden with them. You know, or, or a, uh, a, ra a raptor, they call them raptors, I think it is, uh, uh, caged. I went down to the ark, by the way. I went down there also, I saw the ark. And it's interesting, I mean, for those of you who have never gone there, just go there just for the sake of the scale, because it's built in the real scale of the ark. And for that in itself is worth going down to see just how big that ship was. But the thing of it is, when you get in there and you start walking around and you see raptors in cages with Noah on the ark, you know, and or, and I'm, I've always wondered how they would get a, a triceratops on there, you know, or, or maybe a stegosaurus. I used to study dinosaurs when I was a kid. I was fascinated by them, you know. How'd they get them on there? I mean, some of those things were 72, 82 tons they weighed. But then, of course, the argument is, well, they were babies. 
And then you say, well, you know what the gestation period is? Because Noah wasn't just on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. He was on the ark for over a year. Do you know what the gestation period is of a Tyrannosaurus Rex after a year? Ha, <laughs> it's big. <laughs> it's big. It's, it's enough to eat you out of house and home, as they would say, you know. <laughs> so you don't, you know, you've you got to think these things through. But then the argument goes, because I got into an argument with an archaeologist at a... At a uh, a convention one time, and he and I, we drew a crowd, as a matter of fact, about 30 people in the aisle, but uh, he had dinosaur bones and all that, and he's purporting the fact that the earth is only 6,000 years, and he went down, and he said, well, they were babies. And then finally, when I told him about the uh, gestation period that Noah was on, and he agreed that Noah was on the ark for one year, he said, well, maybe they were just eggs. You know, he kept evolving down. Well, they weren't big, no, they were small, no, no they were eggs. Well, you know, how are you going to argue with this? It's an argument that you just can't win. So as a result, uh, we both agreed to disagree. But there are people today that believe that at down at Wright-Patterson uh, Air Force Base, there are alien bodies from another planet that are still there on ice that they do research on and so forth that was from the crash of Roswell out there in New Mexico in 1947. And or believe that basically even the landing on the moon was all faked by NASA, that we really didn't land on the moon, and that it's all a hoax to just make people think that that uh, was indeed accomplished. And then when you get into the faith community, that is of religion, whoa, now you're really getting into some wild things, if you know what I'm talking about. You've got uh, people, of course, who uh, believe, and this is a, a religion, evolution is a religion, it's a faith, where they think that we came from monkeys, and monkeys are basically our closest cousins in the development of the evolutionary process that has gotten us uh, to this point. Or the Noatian deluge, here's another one that was only regional. It was not global, it, regardless of the fact that almost every culture uh, on earth has the idea of a family in a boat with a bunch of animals were basically the resource by which the earth was repopulated, they ignore that and claim that it was only in a small portion of the world that the world was flooded uh, because allegedly mankind had not spread around the world in the 16 to 1700 years in the pre-flood days. And that was basically about how many years? About 16, maybe 1800 years. Uh, and they claimed that the Noatian deluge was uh, essentially a regional flood as opposed to a, a global flood. And then you got the Noahide laws, you got the Kabbalah, the outgrowths of Judaism, these, these esoteric thoughts and ideas that some are predicated off of the Tal Talmudic law. And then, of course, in the Protestant range uh, and area and uh, environment, you have the health and wealth ministries of the Joel Osteens and the Paula Whites and all of these, the Benny Hins, that are essentially, in many cases, perverting what the gospel was ever intended to be construed as. And as a result of some of this, there are some other ideas, and that's one of the ones that I want to really focus on today for all of us, because uniquely enough, I've been doing some studies on some other subjects, and I was stunned by the ancillary attention it grabbed me by with regards to how much information is on the Internet about what I want to talk about today. I was stunned. I, I, I couldn't believe that there were that many people that believe that angels had sex with female human beings and created the Nephilim, the giants of the world. I want to talk a little bit about that. Is that true? Could it be true? Could angels crossbreed with human beings resulting in a hybrid of some kind of human, hybrid human, that is some kind of a giant that lived prior to the De Noatian deluge and consequently was part of the cause that God got so disrupted over the creation of man that he just decided that he would have to destroy man and start over. Was that really kind of a part of and reason why uh, God actually had to take down the whole human temple in that respect? Because I can't imagine, and as I say here, uh, I was amazed at how many people are on the Internet espousing, advancing, promoting this idea that angels had sexual relations, sexually assaulted, and caused reproductive events that generated giants, hybrid humans, from this crossbreed. 
A lot of it comes from this scripture over here. And I want to turn your attention to chapter 6 in the book of Genesis. I want to take some time to explore some of these scriptures that are associated with chapter 6 and take it slow and kind of like a Bible study almost, go through some of these, what I believe to be gross misinterpretations and egregious misinforming, very misinforming teachings, brethren. Because your Bible is so far from that concept that it amazes me that people could slide into embracing this kind of belief. It's unfortunate that we don't take the time to review the Scriptures because the Scriptures are clear on essentially what is indeed going on. So I hope in covering some of these Scriptures, uh, we can clear up some doubt and further solidify the words and the concepts that come from Scripture and not from the book of Enoch or from other sources that are not scripturally based. The book of Enoch is a spurious book at best. And even the book of Enoch that we have today, there's no telling where that book came from and whether or not that was indeed the book that Jude quoted because that book is not that old. And if you have a copy of the book of Enoch, which I do, you can see that it's just really off the rails compared to Scripture. And a lot of it grows out of some of this esoteric Judaism that has given credibility to certain ideas of men that in, consequently result in embracing some of these far out, off the rail ideas. Brethren, first premise for all of us should be compare it with Scripture. That's where we start. Compare it with Scripture. So I'm not going to go through a lot of the, a lot of the um, arguments with respect to this particular teaching because I just don't have the time. I hope I can get just through this alone uh, with basically laying down some premises to help us clarify the technique and tactic we should use with respect uh, to getting to the bottom of what Scripture has to say about it. So let's go back over here to Genesis chapter 6 and read this. Verse 1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and this is pre-flood, this is during uh, Noah's time, Lamech, you know, the, these, are, these are the guys that lived, Methuselah, before the flood, were before the flood. And we're reading here, and it says it came to pass when uh, men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, beautiful basically is another term. And they took them, wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days, from this point on, shall be 120 years. Remember, up until these points, uh, and after the flood, the days, years of human life were shortened considerably. I mean, Adam lived to over 900. A lot of these guys, Methuselah, over 900 years old. I mean, these guys were uh, basically, uh, literally dinosaurs in some respects, living almost a, a millennia. So uh, God is saying here he's not going to allow that anymore. And he says here in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bear children to them, that's talking about sexual relations, it's talking about intercourse there, shall uh, same became mighty men which were of old, uh, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of thoughts and of heart was only evil continually. And right away, people begin to think that, okay, it's all, and they conflate verses 1 through 5. They conflate that. They merge them together. They bleed them over. They interconnect them and consequently just read through it, and they interpret it as such, whereby the sons of God had sex with human females, and they made giants. Is that what we just read? Brethren, that's not what we just read. It's not what we just read. And if we think that, we are obviously admitting our ignorance of Scripture. There are some premises by which develop and provide us as Christians a framework that we can operate within, that if we indeed stay within that framework, we'll be able to understand this more clearly. 
and be able to understand this uh, particular teaching uh, in the way that Scripture intends for us to think it. I'm not, as I say, going to essentially uh, get into the arguments because I don't have the time. So let me just launch real quickly into some of the premises that Scripture lays down. Turn with me over here. You can keep your finger in Genesis 6. We're going to come back to that. But uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 for a moment. I want to define what is an angel created for. And here in Hebrews... And in chapter 1, and we'll break into the context here in verse 12. And as uh, a vesture shall you fold them up, and they shall be changed, but you are the same, and your years shall not fail. And he's talking about mankind, he's talking about our destiny, and then he says this by drawing a comparison. He says in verse 13, But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, referencing Jesus. Verse 14, are they not all, who? The angels, are they not? And it's a rhetorical question the writer presents. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? Who's that? That's us. So what are the angels created for? It's rhetorical. It's obvious. God intended these angels, after we understand from the writer of Hebrews, the destiny of humankind and how that metric works through Christ and his sacrifice and death, the fact remains, as we understand, then the angels are servants to those heirs of promise that are destined to become, and Jesus said it, not me, God's. Jesus said that in an argument. We're going to come back to that later on, but for now I just want to lay this down so that we understand that essentially the Bible is clear on what angels were created for. Now, the Bible doesn't really give us indication on what angels look like in their spirit form. You with me? That's the operative angels in their spirit form. We understand angels can materialize. They can break the veil. And they can come into our dimension and appear, and we've got proof in Scripture, whether it be in the Old and or New Testament, that angels have indeed uh, gone ahead and materialized. Notice over here, I'm just going to give you one example because of time, but there are many examples that we could reference. Let's go back to Genesis for a moment. And Genesis chapter 18, this is a cool story. When you really look at it in detail and slow it down a little bit, you've got Abraham and Sarah. Sarah's not had been able to have a baby yet. There's a lot of noise going on about Sodom and Gomorrah and how evil it is. And of course, this is uh, after uh, the word in his pre Uh, pre-existing or pre-incarnate time because in chapter 17 you can see that he appeared to Abraham uh, at that time. So Abraham knew what he looked like in his manifested dimensional our time and space condition. So here he comes again, chapter 18, verse 1, and the Lord, Yahweh, appeared, Raha. And that essentially means he was viewed, he beheld, he was able to be seen, it was sighted, he saw. In other words, I'm looking out and I see Joetta. I'm seeing her. That's as clear as it was. I see Joe. I see him. And here he comes, and he's coming down, and he looks, and there's three of them. And you can read the story. I'll paraphrase it for the sake of time, but there's three of them coming down. One of them is the pre-incarnate Christ. Two of them are angels in manifest gear, in tabernacle, (laughs) physical tabernacle, flesh and bone, probably not blood, (laughs) but flesh and bone, materialized in that fashion. And Abraham said, oh, Sarah, kill kill the lamb. We're going to have lunch. Quick, they're coming down. And what did they do? They They had lunch together under a tree. Abraham, with two supernatural, inter-traveling, dimensional beings. This is great stuff, brethren, when you think about it. Interdimensional traveling beings 
who manifested themselves as physical. And there the four of them are, sitting under a tree, talking and eating, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, talking about Sarah, who, uh, you know, was basically uh, uh, going to have a baby. In verse 12, she even laughed. And the Lord, while well, they were who knows how far away, he knew she laughed. And says, why is Sarah laughing? You know, that, that had to be amazing. You know, oh, she's laughing? You know, because this was a, a, a situation where basically uh, they were actually in discussion. We have another situation over here in Matthew 4. Let me take you over here to Matthew 4, the New Testament. I'm just going to show these two to you to illustrate how angels broke the veil and materialized into a form that could be recognized by physical human beings. We have Jesus. He just got over the temptation with Satan the devil. You know the three temptations, the 40 days and 40 nights he was fasting. And here he is. He's exhausted. He hasn't eaten uh, for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's exhausted. Satan leaves him. And notice this, verse 11, chapter 4, book of Matthew. The devil leaves him, and behold angels came and ministered unto him. What do you think they provided? I'm sure they provided bread and water at least, if not some other foods, because this is Christ in his carnate, incarnate condition. He's physical. And these beings who fussed over him, who broke the veil and fussed over him and ministered to him, he created them. He probably knew them by name. Oh, Gabriel, you know, Raphael. I, I don't know who they were that came, but he probably recognized. He's sitting on the dirt, maybe, who knows, on a rock. Maybe he's just sleeping on, on the ground, and they rustled him. You know, think about this. And he said, get up, get up, get up. He's gone. Let's, here, drink this. Eat this. Oh, what, what, what? Oh, Gabriel, what are you doing here? You know, and they're talking. They knew each other. He was their creator. This is good stuff, brethren. But what they look like, in their spirit form, the Bible is, is kind of uh, quiet on that, including demons. Even in Genesis chapter 3, when the nakish, not the snake, but the whispering spirit, not a snake, but a whispering, the nakish in the Hebrew, came to Eve and said, you shall surely not die. Don't listen to that being. He don't know what he's talking about. Doesn't tell us what he looked like. Doesn't tell us what he looked like. We know a little bit of what he looked like before his fall in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, and so forth. I'm not going to go there for time, and we can all go back there and, and, and read that to get familiar with it. But my point, brethren, in all of this, whether it was Satan uh, coming to God, con uh, challenging him on Job, we're not told what he looked like then. The only thing we're told is God said, where have you been? And he said, I've been going to and fro around the earth. <laughs> I've been traveling here and traveling there. I've been over here in you know, France, and I've been over here in Russia. I've been in the United States. I'm, a, I'm all over the place. Oh, have you noticed my uh, servant Job? And you know the rest of the story. But we're not told what he looked like at that point. We're not told uh, at all uh, when he, uh, as I said, appeared uh, it, uh, with Eve and or even at the Last Supper. All we know is he entered in. He entered in to Judas. And Judas became possessed with Satan. We're not told, though, what Satan looked like. He's spirit. He's an interdimensional spirit being that has no boundary, no limitation in the physical world. He can go through walls. He can come through this mic. They're shapeshifters, brethren, in many respects. I don't want to spook you, but, you know, they, they, get, they can do quite a few things because they're not physical. They're not physical. As a matter of fact, it's rather interesting that there doesn't seem to be, at least I wasn't able to find, and certainly uh, if those of you who uh, made no different, uh, I certainly would be open to be told where I can find a demon materially, physically manifesting. It seems as though only good angels, angels that have not fallen, can have that. The fact they lost their first estate, according to Jude, may now prevent them 
interesting as you connect that up with the Nephilim and the ability for them to have sex with human beings. That's another story, as I said. But uh, the fact of it is, is that there doesn't seem to be any real uh, means by which we can actually say an angel or a demon looks like this in their spirit form, in their spirit form. I remember the story, I don't know how many of you do, when the towers came down and a guy had mentioned, perhaps you, I've mentioned this here before, where a guy who was up on one of the floors, I don't know which floor, I forget the story on what floor he was at at this time, but he was trying to find his way down the exit and smoke and all that and the, and the crash and the chaos and all of the things that were going on. And all of a sudden he heard this voice in the dust and in the fog of all the destruction that he was surrounded by in the exit. And he, and he heard the voice say, come here, come here, over here, follow me, follow me, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And, and the guy said, he, he heard the voice, he followed the guy down, he saw the guy, he followed him down, and he, they went down, 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 and uh, running like, like mad, and he was uh, yelling, the guy was yelling, come on, come on, encouraging him to run faster, get going, come on, come on, move, move. And uh, lo and behold, they got outside, outside the building, and the guy was wiping his eyes and all that, and was going to thank the guy, he was gone. Gone. Brings my attention, Hebrews chapter 13, where... You may entertain angels unaware, you see. I don't know about you, but I'm sure it's very selective on when God chooses to intervene in a person's life and does something supernatural to help them along. You hear about stories in World War II, guys that were on rafts, and all of a sudden they have birds falling down, you know, they're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean somewhere. You wonder, how's, how's that happen? What's, what's, is there something we're missing here? You know, interventions and providential events that happen throughout the course of human history. How does George Washington get bullets when he looked at his jacket? He's got bullet holes all over him, and he's not dead. And some of those bullet holes, I mean, this is fact. This is factual fact. They used to teach it in our, our schools back in the 17 and 1800s. And you wonder, you know, how does that happen? Well, the fact of it is, perhaps, we have been entertaining angels in unawares and not even know it. Over here in the book of Luke, Second premise, brethren, second premise in the book of Luke, chapter 20. Here's the story. There's a law in the Torah that says that if a woman dies and she has no children, and uh, I'm sorry, if a woman's husband dies and she has no children, and the husband has a brother, or uh, even for that matter, you can make the case extended family members, that she has the right to ask them to impregnate her so that she can have a baby. It was a different time, I know. Nevertheless, the Pharisees or Sadducees here, uh, who did not believe in the resurrection, and that's why they were Sadducee, <laughs> uh, bad joke, I know, uh, saying, Master, <laughs> you guys are slow, man. <laughs> uh, at any rate, he says, Master, Moses wrote unto us, and he recites this law. And uh, so, uh, verse 32, last of all, the woman dies also. Now, therefore, in the resurrection, this is the question, in the resurrection, whose wife? because she had all these guys and, and no kids, and she had seven brothers, basically. They go down through the scenario. And Jesus answers it this way. Notice, verse 34. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. You're physical. You're human. The marriage covenant is for humans in this respect. That's what Jesus is saying. Verse 35. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, meaning that my wife and I no longer now are married in the kingdom of God. We may work together. And or as spirit beings, if I'm going to see another spirit being who was a female in her previous physical life, am I going to be attracted to her like I am physically? No. No. He's getting to something here. This is the creator talking to us. He's saying, no, no. They, in the resurrection, don't marry. And what's the discussion about this, all this? It's about reproduction. It's about intercourse. It's about having babies. <laughs> that's, that's the topic. And so Jesus is saying, no, no, you, you, you got it wrong here. You, you Sadducees, you, you got to understand that when you are in the resurrection, you don't marry anymore. You don't have sex. There's no more baby making. That's over. You're beyond that. Notice, he says... Neither, uh, oh, let's see here, the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, 
neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels, meaning angels don't die and angels don't have sex. That's what that means, brethren. That's what that means. And so he goes on. You can read the same story. I'm going for the sake of time here. Uh, just reference it in passing, but you can read the sister chapters in Mark 12. You might want to write this down, and you can read it later. Mark 12, verse 18 through 25. And Matthew 22, Matthew 22, 23 through 30. In all three of these areas, this one, Mark and Matthew, we understand by the very words of Jesus Christ, angels don't have sex. They're asexual. They don't have the ability. They don't carry sperm, if I may say so. Can they possess a man to create a rape that impregnates a woman? Yeah, but whose seed is that? The guy's. It's not the demon of possession. So we have to be realistic about this and look and understand that there is no way that this basically can happen. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, but this is our background. And understand that there are some things here that we're not seeing. So let me lay down one more premise before we get back to chapter 6. And in chapter 1, I just want to mention this. In chapter 1 and verse 11, when God started creating actual objects, he caused the waters of the earth there in chapter 1 to recede the land and split the firmament and all that. And then in verse 11, he begins to now create grass and herbs and so forth. There's a key here to understand something. It says, it shall yield... Uh, uh, God says, let the uh, earth, verse 11, bring forth grass and herbs, yielding seed and the fruit in the tree, yielding fruit after his kind. Roses beget roses. Apple trees beget apple trees. Now, there have been hybrids and so forth and different types of farming experimentation and all that, but the original intent, brethren, was species reproduces species. You don't cross. Now, I get gen genetic engineering and what they're doing with the genome and all of that stuff and trying to break down the firewalls of DNA so they can crossbreed certain species with other species. I get all that. But God's original intent was not that at all. He go, we go on here in uh, chapter uh, 1 and in verse... Um, in verse 12, earth brought forth grass and herbs and seed after his kind. Verse 20, uh, God said, let uh, the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life and fowl that uh, may fly above the earth. And God created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. Whales begat whales. Sharks begat sharks. Birds begat birds. That's the way it was. Lions begat lions. And so it goes on in this regard. Uh, and in verse 28, we have, um, or let's go to, I'm sorry, 26, um, or 25. God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle and their kind and everything that creeps upon the earth, insects as well, after his kind. And God saw it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image, in the God image, after our likeness, and let them have domination or dominion over the fish and the sea and the fowl and the air and the cattle and all the earth and so forth and so on. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he male and female created he them. And he blessed them and told them to be fruitful and replenish the earth. And so man was created after the God kind. Man was created after the God kind. So in this case, uh, we see that uh, everything was reproducing after its kind. 
So with this as our backdrop and our framework to work from, let's go back now to Genesis 6. Let's go back to Genesis 6 uh, real quickly here and uh, essentially uh, read these particular uh, words. It came to pass when man began, began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. I'm going to stop right there. Sons of God. That's the big premise. Who are the sons of God? We understand the sons of God are mentioned as uh, angelic beings. We know that uh, they were indeed called sons of God. And in certain scriptures, we uh, certainly recognize that as well. But I want to also bring your attention over here to chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. Cain slew Abel, and we understand that, and then Adam had another son. That son, his name basically, we read here in verse 23, and Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, by the way, he was probably the first polygamist, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, meaning he went in and made a baby. And she bare a son, called his name Seth. For God said, she has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. And he called his name Enos. So Seth had Enos. That was his son. And then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. These Sethites began to be called the sons of God. This is further proved over here in Matthew. Let me take you over here to uh, the book of um, uh, Matthew and in... Um, No, I want Luke. I want Luke 3. Yeah, Luke 3. Most scholars will claim that this is the genealogy of Mary, and uh, it's a tracing. Matthew, uh, I was going to go there, but no need for time. Uh, Matthew is basically the genealogy of uh, what most scholars will claim to be uh, Joseph. But the genealogy is listed here to verify the fact that Jesus came from the house of David and, of course, the line of Israel. More specifically, though, here in Luke, we uh, come down to, we can see in verse 31, Nathan, which was the son of David. There's the line that we're in. And uh, he was the son of Jesse. That was David's father. Dropping down to 34, we've got Jacob and Isaac, who were the sons of Abraham in verse 34. So we're down on this, this particular line, this genealogical line. In verse 35, we've got... Uh, uh, the son of uh, Phalik, which was the son of Heber. That's where we get Hebrew from, Heber. He was Heber's son. And the word Hebrew comes from Hebrew, uh, or Heber comes, uh, is the uh, foundation of Hebrew, which was the son of Selah. And then you have, uh, uh, going down to um, uh, Noah's son, this is the line of Shem. This is the line not of Ham or Japheth. This is the line of Shem out of Noah's group. So now we're, now we're down to the flood uh, here in verse 36. And then we uh, go back further now. Now we're going before the flood. We're going ba uh, backwards. Our, our faxid, uh, verse 36, he was the son of uh, Shem. And we've got uh, Methuselah in verse 37 is the son of Enoch, who was the son of Jared, who was the son of uh, Melel and uh, K. Uh, Anan. And verse 38, we continue on and we say, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So you have men here in this particular case being called sons of God. Jesus himself uh, in John chapter 10 and verse 34 in the argument that he got with the Pharisees and Sadducees and all the religious leaders that he was contending with there uh, as they were picking up stones to throw at him said, why are you stoning me? 
And, he's, and they said, because you make yourself equal with God. And then you would think he'd back down a little bit and say, well, guys, put down the stones and we'll, we'll talk about this later. But he doesn't. He doubles down and he says, well, doesn't the law say? And then he proceeds to quote the writings that right out of Psalms 82 and says that we're all gods. Meaning what? Human beings are the sons of God. That's what Jesus was essentially alluding to there when he pulled 82, Psalms 82, verse 6, out of the context and referenced it there in John 10, verse 34. That's where that argument occurred in the, um, in the um, uh, New Testament. So going back to Genesis chapter 6 here for a moment, we were in verse 2. Let me go back to verse 1 and reiterate. So it comes to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, men from the Seth line, men who were beginning, verse chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 there, I think it was, the last two verses, indicate they were beginning to be called, even in the pre-flood days, the sons of God. This line of Seth, was a line that was going to essentially, ultimately give birth to the incarnate Christ through the tribe of Judah, son of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, and inherit the throne of David. And that was all fulfilled prophecy, even going back to this before the flood, brethren. And so these Sethites, essentially sons of God, these men from the line of Seth, saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, that they took them wives uh, of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with angels. Is that what it says? Nope. It's not about angels. My spirit shall not strive with man. The argument here is with man and these Sethites and these people on earth that are growing in evil. My contention is with man. Here in verse 3, I've got that underlined because it's not about angels. If the Lord, if this was about angels and there were angels crossbreeding with humans, his contention then would be with the angels here. He doesn't say that. He says, the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh yet his days shall be 120 years. The next argument in verse 4, because they, those that believe the other way, conflate this. But the fact of it is, verse 3, period, new paragraph, because the wording in the Hebrew is, there existed, or at that time there was, or in addition, verses 1 through 3. Now, in addition we had giants, on the earth. I'm going to prove to you there were still giants after the flood. There were, brethren, lots of them, lots of them, big guys, 9 to 12, maybe 13 and a half foot high, possibly. That's what your Bible says, not the book of Enoch. Your Bible says these things. One guy even had a bed 13 and a half feet long by 6 foot wide. <laughs> he was so big. <laughs> it's in your Bible. <laughs> this guy was a gargantuan guy. He's even taller than Kobe <laughs> or LeBron James in that respect. But at any rate, uh, he says here, uh, the writer, of course, uh, being Moses in verse 4, chapter 6, book of Genesis, there were or there existed or there be giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bore children, no indication about them bearing giants as children, it just says there were giants on the earth, and then these sons of men, later on, they went in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children. But that doesn't mean they bore giants. The giants were listed before all of that, just as a statement that there were giants on the earth, but the indication is not necessarily that these sons of men were actually generating uh, that, that they, these uh, giants were relative to these daughters in particular. But at any rate, bottom line is, they bore children to them, and the same became mighty men, uh, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thought and his heart was only evil uh, continually. So 
The word here, were, in verse 4, comes from the Hebrew haya, which means to exist or to be, to come to pass or to become. So basically you have existing giants in the earth in those days. Is that so strange? Over here in Numbers, follow me through here. Numbers chapter 13, real quick. Numbers 13. We have, essentially, breaking into the context, verse 33, I'm not going to take a lot of time. This is the spy report of the Israelites when they essentially were uh, looking at the land and so on. Verse 33, And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which of the giant, which were of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. These guys from Anak, which, by the way, most scholars will tell you are connected to the Nephilim, were big guys. We understand Goliath was somewhere between nine feet. That door is seven foot. Standard door is seven foot. Goliath, at minimum, was two feet above that door two feet above that door minimum to his maybe 12 feet high. That's a big guy. He could actually walk up to a basketball net and put it in. <laughs> That's how big Goliath was. Big guy. Really huge fella. And that wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, biggest fellas. If he was only nine foot, uh, Goliath would have been considered perhaps even short. But at any rate, Deuteronomy 2, Deuteronomy 2, as you go through this, you begin to see uh, a relevance of giants. Uh, Deuteronomy 2, and in verse 11, we break into the context. Uh, Emims dwelt there in the times past, a people great and many and tall. This comes from the Hebrew word rum, and it means to rise, raise, to exalt, to to be haughty, it could also have a spiritual connotation. It also means to be taller. Uh, it means even proud. But at any rate, in this particular context, because it says they were like the Anakims, Anakims. And so these were tall, just like the uh, Anakims, and consequently uh, were viewed as uh, such. In verse 20, we read that also... Uh, was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time. That may be a reference to the pre-flood. And the Amorites called them the Zamzumims, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim, Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. And in verse uh, chapter 3 and in verse 11, Continuing on, chapter 3, verse 11, we read this. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of a remnant of giants. And behold, his bed, his bed, this king of Og, his bed was 13 and a half feet by 6 foot wide. That, that's when you calculate it out, that's about how big it was. 13 and a half feet long by about 6 foot wide. That's a big bed. Uh, and uh, consequently... Uh, gives you an idea perhaps of just the size of King uh, Og in that particular case. Joshua, take, go, go over here to Joshua for a moment. And um, in verse 13, and in verse 13, we read basically this. All the kingdoms of Og, here he is again in Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth and in uh, Edri, uh, Edredi, Redi, Redi, uh, who remained of the remnant of the giants. Again, Og is uh, connotated here as being a remnant of the, the giants in his time. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, 1 Samuel chapter 4. I think this is uh, the description that we have of Goliath. And in uh, chapter 4 you have him... Um, First Samuel, I'm sorry, First Samuel 17, 17 verse 4, 17 verse 4. Yeah, this is uh, concerning the um, size of Goliath, the weight of his clothes. He, uh, his clothes weighed 5,000 shekels, which calculates out to about 50 pounds worth of clothes he wore. 50 pounds of clothes. That's a lot of clothes. I wear about five pounds <laughs> of clothes. But uh, 
he, he wore about uh, 50 pounds. 24 and 25, and the men of Israel, they fled because he was so big. They were afraid of Goliath in this case. Second Samuel, last one uh, that I'll go to here, Second Samuel. And in uh, 21, chapter 21, and in verse 16, verse 16, we read uh, Ishbibinab, uh, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels, which was about eight pounds, seven to eight pounds of brass in weight. He being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. And um, in verse 20, it reads here, and there was yet a battle at Gath, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers. He had six fingers on, one, on, on his two hands, and on every foot, six toes, four and 20 in number. And he also was born to the giants. So these are all indications, brethren, that it was not an uncommon thing for people to, uh, to be tall. There are uh, African tribes in Africa that uh, have very tall people, even today, uh, in many respects. The gene of the giants that were indeed pre-flood obviously came over uh, into our time after the flood via, of course, Noah and his sons primarily, and continued to give... Uh, to give birth uh, to these individuals, these lines of uh, particular people. So I guess what I'm saying is that when you look at the book of Enoch, it does not weigh against Scripture. It does not weigh against Scripture. And the sp spuriousness of it is truly reflected by virtue of the contrasting comparison of what it says when you compare it with the framework that the Bible gives you in terms of these particular premises of uh, angels not being able to have sex, that they are asexual, that they're created beings. In other words, angels don't have baby angels. They don't reproduce that way. They're created beings. They cannot cross-breed in the physical dimension. There's no way. I mean, you can get into a lot of uh, things that certainly do uh, breach our time through the interaction of demo uh, demonic activity in the minds and physical uh, bodies of human beings, but that's another story. That's not what the book of Enoch is portraying, and that's not what we've been talking about here in Genesis 6, because the argument is definitively that angels had intercourse with female human beings that created a hybrid species of humans that were called Nephilim, when in fact all the Nephilim were, were were just humans that were from the family or were of the family of Anak. So, I mean, there was no things, nothing special in any respect uh, to uh, a lot of these ideas uh, with uh, regard to um, angels having uh, sex with human beings. So we need to be careful in these times, brethren. You need to take time, really get familiar with God's Word. You need to really uh, take the time to ferret through some of these things so that you're not disinformed. We're living in a time, a day and age, as I said in the beginning, where it's almost TMI. You've got something, you know, for everybody out there. As Garner Ted used to say, you know, there's a following for every kind of kook you can imagine. And there is. There are people that will follow people on any kind of whim. And we've got to be careful. Guard your minds. Guard your minds in this day and age of disinformation because remember, it's going to get so bad. It's going to get so bad, brethren, that even the very elect could be deceived. So let me leave you with this last scripture over here in 2 Timothy. Let me re uh, leave you with this. This was a piece of advice the Apostle Paul gave to a young lad named Timothy, an evangelist, a guy that was really on fire about God's Word. And Paul gave him some advice. In chapter 3, he talked about how all Scripture was given by inspiration of God. And remember, let me remind you, that Scripture he was referencing was the Old Testament. It was the Torah, the law. It was the writings. It was the prophets. Those were the Scriptures. These letters by no means could you ever think Paul had any idea where it's going to become part of a canonized word of God in a Bible. When he wrote these, they were just letters. Letters to, to Bark. Letters to Joe. Letters to Pete. They were just letters. But here in verse 16 of chapter 3, he says all Scripture, meaning that Old Testament is good for profitable, for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that a man may become mature, may become complete, 
he may become perfected through the furnished in all good works. Chapter 4, verse 1 now. I'm charging you, Timothy, meaning I'm mandating you. I order you, Timothy. I'm ordering you, basically. Uh, Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his coming, preach the word. Be instant in season during the feast days. Preach on those doctrinal meanings. Don't deviate. Don't drift. Lest the people forget the underscoring doctrinal meanings of those days. Preach in season. The time to talk about certain things the seasons kind of dictate in many respects. For the church to stay healthy, Timothy, preach in season and out of season. That's when you go off the grid and preach about other subjects. Oftentimes you go to the Feast of Tabernacles, sadly, and you hear sermons that are totally irrelevant to the feast. What in the world is he talking about that subject for? I didn't come here to hear that. I came here to hear about the kingdom of God. I came here to hear about the resurrection, about spirit tabernacling, physical tabernacle. I didn't come here to, you know, uh, hear about something else. I came here to hear about the kingdom of God. That's what I want to hear about, and my destiny, and my future, and why I'm living, and what I'm breathing for. But oftentimes, we find the church veering off and not preaching in season. Paul says, be instant, Timothy, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, brethren, and it's here. It's here. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I know better. I saw it on the internet. What are you talking about? I know better. I slept at the Holiday Inn, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about where people just think they know it all because they had a five-minute tutor, tutor, uh, tutorial, tutorial. <laughs> that's it, tutorial on something that, uh, you know, they didn't know anything about, but now they're experts because they read five minutes of this and the other thing on, on the Internet. So he says here, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is not sound doctrine. Enoch is not the book of sound doctrine. It's spurious. Throw it away. Nothing there to learn other than just read about some guy's ideas. But at any rate, he says, but, there, but after their own lusts shall they heap themselves teachers having itchy ears, appeasers, people that speak things that are nice, things that you know, people find comfort in. Sweet Jesus, nothing wrong with it, but nevertheless, doctrine needs to be salt and peppered in there. Verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Angels having sex with human beings is nothing more than a mythical fable, brethren, out of a spurious book that a lot of people, out of their curiosity, have been hooked into believing and thinking is true. But when you take the time, compare it to the framework of God's Word, it doesn't work. It doesn't hold water. Always stick to the Word of God for the framework by which you're going to embrace something. 